So, so we are talking about mitosis today, and uh, you should have picked up. I put a little sticky note here just to pick this up. If you just, if you didn't, if you didn't print it out because for some reason it didn't get printed in the, the note packet. Um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the. Um, about chromosomes and um, humans and um, the chromosome number and so on in humans and then we're gonna get to a, a activity where you're going to look at uh, cells undergoing mitosis and um, calculate time spent in the various phases of cell division based upon looking at the different cells in um, uh, the different phases. So that's kind of what we're going to do today. And so this lab activity will start today and probably have to finish tomorrow. Most people in other hours were not able to do. There's two parts to it. We're not able to finish both parts. All right, today. So so that's the plan for at least for the next couple days. So uh, mitosis is one type of cell division that we have in uh, humans. And um, we have another type of cell division called meiosis. And we have two different types of cell division because we have two different types of cells that we make. Can somebody remember from the notes, what are the two kind of categories of cells that we have in our body? Somatic and gametes. Somatic and gametes. And so, um, somatic cells are basically any cell in your body that's not a gamete, and a gamete is our egg and our sperm cells. And so we have a, what, a mitosis is the cell division that we use to make our somatic cells, all of our body cells that are not egg and sperm cells. And then meiosis is another whole cell division used to make your egg and sperm cells. Can somebody tell me why it is that we have to make our egg and our sperm cells in a different way than our somatic cells? That's right. In humans, our normal somatic cell chromosome number is 46. Each chromosome is made out of a piece of DNA. So we have 40. We start out with 46 pieces of DNA at the beginning of cell division, and um, so we have 46 eventually chromosomes. And so in mitosis, like in our body cells, so this I left up here from last hour. If this is a cell, this is a nucleus. We have 46 chromosomes in all of our body cells. Uh, and so when we go to make more of them, like in our skin cells, I talked about how our skin cells constantly flake off. We constantly make new skin cells. And so how we do that is by cell division. And so every skin cell and every body cell in our body besides egg and sperm cells need to have 46 chromosomes to have the right amount of DNA and to function properly. We'll see later that if you have an abnormal number of chromosomes, sometimes the cell won't, won't even survive. Sometimes um, if you have an abnormal number of chromosomes, you can survive, but you have some um, characteristics um, that um, are, can be troublesome. Um, some features, this is a lot of gen some genetic disorders are caused by abnormal numbers of chromosomes. So 46 for humans is the magic number in order to, to the correct number and the amount of DNA for a human body cell. So when we our, our cells divide, you want each of those new cells to have the correct number of chromosomes, which is 46. So therefore, when the cell divides, it grows and divides, and you get two cells with 46 chromosomes. So therefore, the DNA has to replicate, or you have to duplicate it, so that each new cell has um, the correct amount. Um, in egg and sperm cells, egg and sperm cells need half the amount of um, uh, chromosomes. So in meiosis, you start out with a cell that has 46 chromosomes. And my, meiosis is what chapter 13 is all about, so I'll get into the details more about this um, later. But um, meiosis, basically, there's two parts to it, and you end up at the end of meiosis with four cells, each with 46 chromosomes, or sorry, not 46, 23 chromosomes, half the number that we originally started out with, and so this is the nucleus. So, so we have body cells that divide by a whole different division called meiosis to make these egg or sperm cells. So let's say this is a female, so these would be egg cells at the end. And so what uh, in humans, in the ovaries is where the cell would be that divides to make your egg cells. 
For males, they also go through meiosis. It's the cell at the beginning would be in the testes to make the egg and the, uh, to make the sperm cells. And so a male will go through the same process of meiosis to produce sperm. And so, so that sperm cell would have 23 chromosomes as well. So here's a sperm. So then what happens is a sperm can fertilize an egg cell. And when that happens, you get now your the one cell baby, which is called a zygote, having 46 chromosomes, half from mom, half from dad. Um, and so then this baby, the zygote, would now then begin to divide by mitosis and become two cells big with 46 chromosomes and four cells and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? All right, and so we grow by mitosis here. All right, so, um, so I wanna talk a minute about the chromosomes themselves. And so let me put a picture up here. This is just a computer, cartoon computer generated picture here, but here's some chromosomes. And what a chromosome differs by is, um, is the length. So we have some chromosomes that are longer than others, some are shorter. Um, the other thing is the banding pattern, this coloration where they have dark and light spots. They call those bands on the chromosome. And also the indentation where the uh, centromere, that's the indentation is. Sometimes it's more towards the middle. Like this one, the centromere is close to the end so that one end of the chromosome is very, very small. And so that varies. And so, <coughs> so that's how we can tell one chromosome um, from another. So if we look at, let's say, this chromosome here, is there, let me dim the lights, is there another chromosome that looks like that one? Yeah. I know some of them are off the page there. But you should be able to find one that looks like that, and that is this one, all right? Uh, and so, so uh, it's the same size, the band pattern matches, and the location of the centromere um, is the same. Is there one like, let's do a different color here. Let's do this one. Is there one like this one? this game and and continue matching them up my point is is that we have not only 46 chromosomes but we have pairs of them so another way to say that is that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes um, and so the meaning pairs meaning that they um, look identical all right and can match up my next question is why we have pairs of One we get from mom, one we get from dad. So let's say this came in mom's egg cell, this came in dad's sperm cell, and same thing here. And we do that, and we can match them up. Um, and so we have 23 pairs. And so, <coughs> so what happens is, is that when we say that mom gives 23 chromosomes and dad gives 23 chromosomes to give you 46, it's not just any 23 chromosomes, it's one of every kind. So in mom's egg cell, there's one that looks like this, there's one that looks like this, there's one that looks like this, there's one of every kind. And the same thing with dad's sperm cell. So that when egg and sperm unite, the baby has two of every kind of chromosome and they're in pairs. And so, so what happens is, is that when we study chromosomes, um, geneticists will um, uh, get, extract chromosomes uh, or pictures of chromosomes from a cell. And the, the thing is, is that when you're looking at a cell going through cell division, so remember this from the notes, that in interphase, when the cell is preparing to divide, there aren't really chromosomes. They are in the long stringy format called chromatin, and you can't see them in that phase. So it's not until a cell is actually going through the process of mitosis 
where the chromatin, the long stringy DNA, condenses to form these short, stocky little structures called chromosomes. And it's when that happens that you can actually see the chromosomes. And so um, what happens is when people are studying chromosomes and looking at um, somebody's chromosomes, they'll pick a cell that's actively dividing so that the, the, the DNA has condensed and you can actually see the chromosomes. And so remember then that the chromosomes are replicated at this point. So what does that mean? This side is an exact copy of the DNA of this side. Um, and so they make an exact copy here. So if I looked back over here, when the cell is getting ready to go through cell division, like for this one here, it, this is side would be made out of one piece of DNA, and then it would make an exact copy of that DNA on this side here. And so this would be called a replicated chromosome. It has two sides, two, two pieces of DNA that are identical for them. And so when a cell is going through cell division, that's what they look like. And so what they do is they make something called a karyotype. And a karyotype looks like this. So what they've done is from this picture to this picture, the DNA it is replicated. So each chromosome kind of looks like an X. And so one side, let's say the green side, was the original, and then the blue side is the copy of the DNA held together at the centromere, that indentation. And so this right here would be a replicated chromosome that came from the person's mom. And then this here, this is let's say the original DNA, copy of the DNA held at the centromere. This is the replicated chromosome that came from dad. So we have two chromosomes here, two replicated or, or sometimes called duplicated chromosomes there. And what they do is they order them and find the matches and put them in the order from largest to smallest. So uh, an example of how they do this, um, so they take a cell that's going through cell division and they put it in a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic solution we put a cell in a hypotonic solution. Where's the higher water concentration? Here's the cell, the solution on the outside is hypotonic. Higher concentration is in the hypotonic solution. So therefore water will move high to low, so into the cell. The cell is gonna swell up. And then what happens is, is as that cell swells up, they don't let it burst. What they do is they, they suck it up in a little micro pipette hold it above a glass slide and squeeze it and let the, the cell free fall. And what's it gonna do when it hits this glass slide? It's gonna splat. And when it splats, the chromosomes also splat across there. And then they dot, can dye them so that you can see the chromosomes. Then they usually, underneath the microscope, they can focus it and there's a camera that they can hook to the microscope that hooks up to the computer. So they take pictures of it. Now you get these pictures of these um, dyed chromosomes and then they can, they have computer programs where they can cut and paste and move the chromosomes around and find the matches. And they match them up. So based upon size and the location of the centromere and the banding patterns and so on. And so then they put them in the, this arrangement called a karyotype. It's basically the pairs arranged from largest to smallest. And a, per, uh, a geneticist will do this to basically to, to see, they're usually seeing if the person has a normal amount of chromosomes, the number of chromosomes. So they, they will do this to look for certain um, genetic diseases that are caused by abnormal numbers of chromosomes um, and so on. So it's ranged from largest to smallest. And here's the 22nd pair. And then look at here, the 23rd pair is always in the bottom right hand corner. These are your sex chromosomes. They're called that because they determine your, the sex or gender of the person. And so this defies the rules of putting them in largest, in order from largest to smallest. Because if you notice here, we have two sex chromosomes. We have an X chromosome and a Y. This person has two X chromosomes that are fairly large. They normally, if you're doing the largest to smallest, would be up here somewhere, but they put them in the bottom right hand corner. The reason why is so that when you're looking at a karyotype, you can quickly, your eyes can just go to that bottom right hand corner and tell real quickly if the person is a male or a female. So this person has two X chromosomes. This person has an X and a Y. So notice that this person's 23rd pair of chromosomes, they don't look identical, but we still consider them a pair. So this is the only non-identical pair that we have um, in humans. And so this person here with the X and a Y, do you guys know what gender that is? No, that's a boy. 
this is a boy, all right? Males have X, Y for that 23rd pair. So that means this one is a female, all right? And so they put that there just in the bottom right-hand corner so we can easily tell. So again, so when we look at you know, organization of chromosomes and when we say that we have 46 chromosomes and we talk about mitosis and it, the, the DNA replicates and then divides so that each new cell has 46 chromosomes, it's specific two of every kind. So this one is, needs to have two chromosome number ones, two chromosome number twos, threes, fours, and so on. It's just not any 46. It has to be specifically one, uh, two of every kind. Um, and so the same thing goes with this one. And then when egg and sperm cells are made, it's specifically not uh, for 23 chromosomes. It's not just any 23 chromosomes. This egg, egg cell has to have one chromosome number one, one chromosome number two, three, four, five. So that when the sperm fertilizes it, the sperm also has one chromosome number one, one chromosome number two, so that the baby has two of every kind. All right, so that's um, what I wanted you to understand with this. All right, so now we're gonna look at the lab. to read through read through um, the first page front and back and the third page through the procedure there so so read through that take a few minutes and do that
first part, um, and the purpose of this is to um, allow you to be able to look in and see wheel cells in the different phases of mitosis because it looks a little bit different than in the computer generated pictures where you can see that each of the chromosomes nice and easily and you can see all the, the spindles and so on. Um, when you look at cells underneath the microscope, um, you, you can see what the chromosomes are doing, but you can't really see the spindle and the spindle fibers and things like that. Um, they're, they're just not um, big enough and thick enough to be able to see there. So you have to look at different cells to just figure out what phase of the cell cycle they're in. We look at what the chromosomes are doing. And so what you're going to be looking at, the lab talks about two different types of cells. They talk about the onion root tip and whitefish blastula. The reason why both of these are picked is because there are areas of the, the, um, the organism that have actively dividing cells. So not like, if you think about an organism, not every part like of the human body, the cells are actively dividing all the time. So, so, and so in a whitefish blastula, blastula is a very early stage in development. So this is kind of like even before an embryo, like an embryo is a certain amount of cells big that the, that the um, baby is. So the, the whitefish blastula was very early on in development. So the cells are actively dividing to grow into a, an embryo and then into a whitefish, which is a type of fish. And so, um, and then the onion root tip, we're gonna look at the onion root tip. The reason why I chose the onion root tip is because you can see the chromosomes and what they're doing a lot easier than you can with the whitefish blastula. So the onion root tip, I have prepared slides. They're in the corner here of the desk. And you can't see it, but um, in, the, in the slide, embedded in the slide, are two onion root tips. And you can see them there. And so what, how this was made is that somebody <coughs> took an onion root and made a very, very thin slice of it, put the thin slices on the microscope slide, then put some dye on it so that we'd be able to see the chromosomes. So the chromosomes look like a purplish, pinkish color, so you can see the cells in the chromosomes. And then they dyed it, and then they put a cover slip on it um, and glued it down so that this, the cells in these onion root tips are forever in whatever stage of my, uh, mitosis they were going through at the time, they're forever in that stage, they're locked in that. Um, and so these guys are dead. Um, and so, what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at it underneath the microscope. And so I'm just gonna do a quick little lowdown about the microscope so that um, everybody understands how to use it. On our microscope, there are three objectives or lenses. Um, there's the scanning. The scanning is the shortest one. Then there's 10X, which is the next longest. And then there's the 40X, which is the, lar the, the longest. They go up in increasing magnification. And so the longest one, the 40X, will increase the uh, magnif magnification the most. To find your cells underneath the microscope, we always start with the scanning power. What the scanning power will do is allow you to move the microscope slide around to scan the slide or find your specimen that you want to look at. So you're, you know, you get the slide, the slide, the, you know, the onion root tip on the slide is just a very, very small portion of the slide. So when you put the slide on the stage, what you want to do is try and center, there's a little hole there where the light comes through from the bottom. You want to put your onion root tip on that, um, that part that will be illuminated. And so, <coughs> so that's the scanning. So you're going to move it around until you see your onion root tip and then you're going to focus and you can use the for the scanning power you can use the course adjustment which is the large knob the large knob moves the stage up and down fairly fairly rapidly what that does is allow you to focus on the the, the slide and so what you'll see is a circle and this is called your field of view so up from the bottom is light coming in and you want to make sure that when you put your onion root tip your onion root tip will look like this um, you want to put the part that you want to focus on in the center of the slide. What part do we want to focus on on the onion root tip? They talked about the part called the apical meristem. So let me just talk about that for a second here. So your apical meristem is, this is called the root cap, and this is the right here. This is where you want to look at. So these guys are dividing. This is your apical meristem. I don't want to use the root cap. The reason why is the root cap, these cells aren't going through cell division. The purpose of the root cap is for protection. So what you're actually looking at, so this is a plant, and here's your roots. Your roots grow 
All right, um, like this. All right, so they're going to grow up there just to, to spread out to get more water and so on. So you're looking at the very tips of these roots. And so the tips, the very cap here, is protection so that as these roots grow out in the soil and they're going through the soil, which is harsh, um, it's a protection and it protects these cells that are actively dividing. So what happens is this root is going to grow by two, for two reasons. These cells are going to divide, so they're going to become more cells big, so it's just going to make the root grow in this way. And then when the cells divide and they make new cells, those cells that are made will elongate and become longer. And so then that will also push and make the, the root longer, and so it will go into the soil that way. So that's why you're looking at the section right above the root cap. So you want to make sure that that part is in the center of your field of view. So here, this is the cap. This is what we want in the center. The reason why we want it in the center, this is really important and where a source of frustration for some students if you don't get this, um, is that when you go now, now that you have it focused on the scanning, then you can go to the 10X. So you move your lens over. And when, the, when you do that, the microscope takes whatever's in the center and that's what it enlarges. So now, when you look underneath your field of view, this X is gonna be much bigger because it takes that and, and enlarges it. So if you put your, your slide on here and your apical meristem is here and you go to the next power, you won't see anything. So oftentimes I'll have students go, it was there, it was, now it's not there, and that's usually the reason why. All right, so focus it and center it. And so then it enlarges it and then you can focus again on the middle power, the 10X, you can also use the course adjustment. It should be, if you focus on the scanning, you shouldn't have to adjust it very much, but you can just adjust it so it's clear. Um, you can also use the fine focus, um, which um, adjusts it just a little bit, um, which is the smaller knob. And then once you're focused on this power, and you might you can move it around to make sure the cells you want to look like are in the center. And again, when you go to the, lar the higher power, it's going to take what's in the middle and enlarge it here. All right, and so that's going to be enlarged here. So you're going to have um, just that part enlarged. All right, and so one thing with the once you go to the higher power, you can only use the fine adjustment. So only use the small knob. If you lose the this is really important. If you use the coarse knob, it moves the stage up and down so much that it might jam you might jam the stage and the slide right into your lens because when you go to put it on the higher power it will be really, really close to your microscope slide. I actually sometimes have students afraid it's gonna scratch it because it's so close, the, the objective when, it, when you put it on there. So it's gonna be really close to your microscope slide. So you just wanna use your fine adjustment which moves the stage up just ever so slightly to if you need to focus it, okay? So that's, that's real important to know. <clears throat> All right, and so then you focus on it. And then, then at that particular point, this is called your field of view when you look at whatever you're looking at underneath the microscope at that time. And so <clears throat> you're gonna find and look for the cells in the various stages. So if you look at your packet, there's a spot to draw a picture for what the cells look like in the various stages of cell division. So we have interphase and it gives you a little synopsis as far as what's happening. And then the rest of the, the phases. The purpose of this is, is again, is so that you get used to um, what the cells look like in the various phases. And then there are a few um, questions, there's three questions, and then I wanna draw your attention to the next part, which is exercise 3A.2. So look at that, look at that, and I'm gonna have you read through that procedure real quick.
So this part here, the second part, you're gonna be working with a partner. One person will be the, um, the person that's gonna look through the lens of the microscope and the other person will be the recorder. And what you're gonna do when you get to the highest power, you're gonna see these enlarged cells, they're plant cells. And so they're gonna look like little rectangles like this. And so if you're the, so you're working with a partner, one person's gonna look through the, the lens of the microscope and systematically, um, it, you can go across like this, you can go in, in uh, columns or whatever, you're gonna look at each cell and tell what phase it's in. Is it interphase, prophase, metaphase? So, so, so if I'm the one looking through, I'm gonna go down here and say, okay, this one's an interphase. And if Sage is my partner, what he can do is on his, ta on his um, table on the back page, is where, where it says interphase, he can put a little tally mark. So he's gonna put interphase. Then I say prophase, and then he's gonna put one in prophase. And then interphase again, he's gonna put another tally in interphase, and so on. And so what happens is that person can just go through and look at the cells, and you're gonna do um, 200 cells. Um, and at least 200, you can go a little bit over, but at least 200. Um, and so <coughs> that may take different fields of view. What is a field of view? A field of view is one placement of the microscope and the cells you see there. So then if let's say you, you do all these cells and let's say you have 100 cells, you have to still 100 cells to go. And so what you can do is you can move your microscope slide so then you can move it over so you're looking at the cells over here or up here or so on. And then remember you also have two onion root tips on one slide so you can go to the second onion root tip as well. Um, and so it, so they put different fields of view on here, field one, field two, field three. You may get, depending upon that, you may get all 200 on your first field. It's not the amount of fields that you have, just get 200 cells, okay, um, with that. And so you put your little tally marks on there and then from that we can calculate time spent in each phase of um, mitosis, all right, from that. So, so that's why the first part is really important because whoever's looking at to the second part needs to be able to quickly kind of tell is it in interphase, is it in prophase, is it in metaphase, and so on. So the first part is so that you're familiar with that, all right? And then you can argue with your partners who's the ones gonna look in the microscope and who's gonna be the tally person, all right? Um, so that's what we're going to do today. So you're going to go back. I will introduce you to the second part, but we're going to do the first part first. Um, and so I had uh, last hour leave their microscopes out. What I had people do is just kind of use the microscope standing up around the pods. Um, so some people stood up around here. One, I have one right here. One group plugged it in here, plugged it in here, but stood here and looked at it. Um, I have two set up in the back counter there um, that you can use the plug there on the wall so people can sit down and do it there. Um, and I have one up here. So I think there's plenty around. Um, and so you can go ahead and get started. The slides are in the, um, over here. And I think we have even numbers of people. So Raymond and Savannah will have you guys work together. And Shane and Ryan will have you guys work together. Oh, and then, <laughs> the person right So we need a group of three. You can just join someone. All right. All right. slides are better than others so um, if you're having a real hard time you can call me over and if you still we still have problems we can switch out the slides